Happy Friday, everybody. Rob here with the end of the week show. Last night I counted my shows, and I guess I've done 39 shows so far, which is nice. I'm on my 40th show on Monday. So maybe I'll bring something special. Not sure yet what the topic might be. I have an email address, so if you got any suggestions this weekend, just email me and let me know what you would like to uh, have for the 40th show for a topic. Anyway, today I am going to read a passage of scripture from Thessalonians. It is concerning the snatching away. Now, this is an exciting topic because it's for the members of the body of Christ, those who are chosen before the disruption of the world, to be called out and snatched away to meet the Lord in the air. And uh, this, I believe, is the next event that's going to occur before the Great Tribulation hits the earth. And uh, we are the next ones to receive immortality. And it is a special calling. Yes, it is. Uh, we have been given belief and a realization during our lifetime that we are members of the body of Christ. So this is very exciting. It is 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13, 13 through 18. Now we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who are reposing, lest you may sorrow according to the, as the rest, also who have no expectation. For if we are believing that Jesus died and rose, thus also those who are put to repose will God through Jesus lead forth together with him. For this we are saying to you by the word of the Lord, that we the living, who are surviving to the presence of the Lord, should by no means outstrip those who are put to repose. For the Lord himself will be descending from heaven with a shout of command, with the voice of the chief messenger, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall be rising first. Thereupon we the living, who are surviving, shall at the same time be snatched away together with them in clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus shall we always be together with the Lord, so that console one another with these words. Okay, that was the passage of Scripture. Now I'm going to go into detail with a little article I found by a gentleman by the name of Donald Hader. And he wrote a really good article here explaining a little bit more detail about the snatching away. It's not a long one, so don't panic. It's not going to be like 20, 40, 30 minutes, whatever. <laughs> it's going to be a short article today. It's Friday. And let us enjoy this time together. And it's always good. It is a help sometimes when seeking to understand why a certain word is used in, the particular, in a particular context to substitute another. It highlights the significance of the word that is used. Not that we can replace any word in the scriptures. For they stand supreme among all literature in that the words are used with the utmost discrimination and ex exactitude. Seven times are they refined. Consider this phrase in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, which I just read. We might have read it instead of snatched away that we are taken up or that we ascend or go up. But each of these latter words convey, conveys a different thought which was not intended by the Holy Spirit. We are snatched up. That is, our departure is an urgent, swift, sudden plucking up, which, which, thoughts the, which thoughts the other words do not convey. The word snatch is used elsewhere in the scriptures, and is, its sense can be intensified in our minds by considering some of these other contexts. Philip was snatched away from the eunuch, and that is Acts chapter 8, verse 39. Now when they stepped up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatches away Philip, and the eunuch did not perceive him any longer, for he went his way rejoicing. Okay, it was a sudden, abrupt departure. When Paul's safety was threatened by the throng in Acts 23.10, the captain ordered the troop to descend and snatch him out of their midst. So that was Acts 23.10. Yet much commotion occurring, being afraid, the captain, so Paul, should not be pulled to pieces by them, orders the troops to descend and snatch him out of their midst, besides to lead him into the citadel. Okay. Okay. 
Sorry, I just got lost my way there for a minute. Uh, on another occasion, in one of the most miraculous and, and amazing events of Paul's life, he was snatched away to the third heaven and into paradise. Chapter 12, verse 4. Okay. Okay. That he, okay. That he was snatched away into paradise. And here's ineffable declarations, which is not allowed a man to speak. He had then an experience similar in this one respect to that which will occur again to him when, with us, he will be snatched up into the air. These examples, if we consider them, will help us grasp the significance of the word snatch when it is used of our introduction into the presence of the Lord at his coming. When the Lord comes, he will snatch us up to him with urgency and speed. We shall not rise to our own volition though we shall be fully capable of doing so. Perhaps we hesitate, not realizing our power, or perhaps awed by the presence of the Lord, fearful to approach him, but we are not left a moment longer. Simultaneously together in clouds, the dead in Christ who have been raised from the dead and the living will be snatched up in clouds simultaneously together. These two words are not synonymous one refers to the time of the snatching, and the other to the proximity in space of which the two parties go. The snatching upward will, will occur at the same moment for all in Christ. Wherever they may have died, in whatever region in the world, their swift transfer from the earth to the air will happen at precisely the same moment. There will not be some who will be, uh, approach the Lord more slowly. With speed and urgency, the Lord will snatch us up to himself. Also, also, the movement upward will be together. We will not be spread over the expanse of sky singly or in scattered groups, according to where we were located in life or in death. We will be assembled and rise in one company to meet the Lord. It will not, however, be mass, a mass strong. There is a single assembly, for we are snatched up in clouds. Now, this does not mean that we shall ascend to, in the clouds of the sky but uh, that we shall uh, be assembled like clouds to, and so ascend to the Lord. This is not an uh, unusual figure of speech, for a mass assembly is often referred to as a cloud. We read of a vast cloud of witnesses in Ezekiel 38, 16. Gog goes, Gog goes up against Israel, a great assembly, as a cloud to cover the land. Again, in Isaiah 60, chapter 60, verse 8, those who bring the sons of Israel from afar to the land as a thick cloud are flying. There are other groups, other examples. A very apt example is its use is by astronomers who refer to a large group of stars as star clouds. The photographic plate shows that this is most distinctly. Just how the saints will be grouped, we are not told. It may be according to the generation in which we have lived, or according to our place and function in the body of Christ. It is enough to know that the vast assemblage, assemblage of saints will cover the sky as clouds in the vault of heaven, and thus we shall always be together with the Lord. To meet the Lord in the air. The contrast between the coming of the Lord for the ecclesia with a celestial destiny and his coming for Israel are great. To the earth he comes as son of man, kind. For us he returns as the Lord and chief messenger. When coming to Israel, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. For us he descends no further than the air. He travels alone from heaven's height for us. But for his earthly people, he is accompanied by his holy messengers. These may be the vast array seen in the million, in the, in the throng scene of the unveiling, numbering two great groups of hundred million and one million. The group, the glory of his presence will differ on each occasion. For Israel, he will appear as he was on the Mount of Transformation, his face shining as the sun. The brilliance of his glory will not be greater than his terrestrial saints can endure. For us, he will come as a celestial one with a different glory, one exceeding in brilliance and brightness as the noonday sun. 
but we shall be able to look and live. For we too shall be celestials, changed into beings with a glory similar to the Lord's. He himself assembles us with his own voice and his own trumpeting and his personal statue upward. Israel will be gathered by his messengers. We shall meet the Lord a personal face-to-face -face encounter. Israel is assembled to him. The intimacy indicated in the word meet is absent from the record uh, of that assembly. The grace shown to us transcends anything that Israel has. Where then in the air in which we meet the Lord? In this context, it is the same as we understand in it in general conversation. It is a part of the atmosphere which contains a mixture of gases essential to earth life on earth. It stretches upward for a few miles. Even at the top of the highest mountains, the air is very thin. At 10 miles up, we, we, we could not live without artificial aids. For the air is almost absent, so it is certain that we shall meet the Lord in the blue expanse above, within the few miles of the Earth's surface, within the sight of our erstwhile home. Now, when you fly on an airplane, you notice how I love it. When I'm up there in an airplane, I love the really blue, blue. And when I'm, and when I'm looking at it, it is so wonderful. And just that is a touch of space. And it's so extremely brilliant blue. And it's so clear and so colorful and so awesome, right, when you look at it. And I really enjoy that every time I fly. So this is a, a little example of where we meet our Lord in the air. I believe, anyway. One of the most important feature of this meeting place is that it is the territory of the adversary, Satan, for he is the chief of the jurisdiction of the air. It is from the air that he controls the earth's affairs. To him have been given all the kingdoms of the earth, and the affairs of mankind are under his sway, political and religious. He is a spirit making his headquarters in the air above us. And it is here that we shall meet the Lord in the heart of the enemy's kingdom. But this is for a purpose, for it will be the role of the ecclesia, which is the body of Christ, to display the to the arch enemy of God and, and his truth, the power and glory of the sons of God. Then will, will be fulfilled the words. The God of peace will be crushing Satan under your feet swiftly. It will not be a battle, but by power of the presence of Christ and his body, or the ecclesia. So think about that today. This is a beautiful, beautiful message to the members of the body of Christ. We have an expectation. We're going to meet our Lord in the air. We're going to be snatched away. It's not going to be some fanciful or, like, I don't know, dreamlike state. It'll be an actual reality, and we will meet our Lord face to face. This is our expectation. Enjoy it. Love it. I love you all in the Lord, and we will see you Monday for my 40th anniversary show. Happy Friday.